Hi, welcome back to the History Zinc podcast. I'm Mallory Nye, and this is episode 15. In this episode, I'm going to be looking at culture and the portrayal of history in Australia, particularly with regard to the past and present Indigenous people in that country. This all spins from a very recent TV show about the possibilities of an Indigenous superhero fighting white supremacy. Today's episode, then, is called Clever Man, an Indigenous TV superhero. How should Australia try to understand its unsavoury history? In the midst of the US controversy over HBO's planned portrayal of race and slavery in a new TV drama called Confederate by the makers of Game of Thrones, the responsibility of cultural media to challenge and reassess has become even more urgent. Perhaps producing TV dramas such as Clever Man is a step in the right direction. Now, I must say straight off, I'm not a fan of superhero movies. From what I've seen, most of the mainstream superhero genre is orientalist, racist, misogynist and profoundly white. The movie Doctor Strange is an obvious example here on a number of levels. It seems that a modern superhero is not required to fight the forces of state systematic oppression, particularly if that is race-based oppression. Instead, for the large part, action superheroes tend to be portrayed literally as white saviours against external, often racialized, malevolent forces. In the case of the movie Suicide Squad, the external menace was literally a powerful dark spirit of pre-European America, which the US government were trying to violently control. So the production of Clever Man by Sundance TV in Australia stands out in many distinct ways. Its possibility has perhaps been aided by the innovations of Jessica Jones and Luke Cage on Netflix, and also by Jane Campion's surgical dissection of structural social misogyny in Top of the Lake. But it also contains something far more than anything that has preceded it. It's literally a critique of normative white supremacism, dressed up as near-future science fiction. And in doing so, it's brutally honest. For me, one of the greatest achievements of Clever Man is its majority Indigenous cast. The show has a creator, Ryan Griffin, directors, Wayne Blair and Leah Purcell, and a number of leading actors from Indigenous backgrounds. It's hard to believe that this has actually happened on a mainstream show on Australian TV. Despite this, it's also slightly annoying that the actor Ian Glenn is presented as one of its main stars, since although his performance is good, he is not where the strength and distinctiveness of Clever Man lies. But this itself reflects the world that Clever Man is portraying, in which the government, the securitised state and media moguls call the shots. Clever Man also breaks new ground through it putting indigenous narratives at its centre. It explores those narratives, whilst also exploring and highlighting systematic racism and the deadly power of dehumanising discourses. By focusing on superheroes and the struggles of ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances, the story shows without preaching. The nation that is called Australia has a fairly long and difficult history to deal with. As a far outpost of the British Empire, it developed into its contemporary form on the basis of two contradictory values. That is, white Australians, like the British as a whole, saw themselves as a decent and civilising society, whilst at the same time structuring their lives and the wider wealth of their nation and empire on brutal and violent racism for the benefit of appropriating resources. In the case of British settlement in North America, this theft of resources included not only materials and land, but also people. In the chattel slavery system that prevailed under the British for over two centuries, By the time the British came to settle on the large inhabited landmass they called Terras Australis, i.e. Australia, they had decided that enslavement was no longer morally or economically expedient. But the British sense of entitlement through conquest of land, food, water and other resources still remained, 
In short, British soldiers and settlers decided that the lands of Australia were there for the taking, and so they took them. The question of what to do with the people who were already there was largely left unresolved. British legal systems were put in place, including rights of ownership, with very little attempt to relate such laws to whatever was already in place before their arrival. It was a full-scale, near-total invasion. The native people of the land mass were often called Aboriginals, but are now usually referred to as Indigenous people. Note that's not Indigenous Australians, since of course Australia is itself part of the terminology of the European settlers. The indigenous people had been there for a very long time, around about 50 to 60,000 years. In this respect, the presence of Australians for just over 200 years is merely the blink of an eye. However, a lot can happen in two centuries, and the facts on the ground of colonial settlement have been created to a large extent at the expense of the many different indigenous cultures and groups. To create contemporary multicultural Australian society, Indigenous people have been excluded, marginalised, massacred, imprisoned and discriminated against in a systematic way. Such racism is not through individual weaknesses of individual white Australians. It has been, and largely still is, part of the system. Perhaps the most notorious of policies against Indigenous peoples was part of the White Australia programme, which resulted in the stolen generations of Indigenous children. Similar to the residential schools programme in British Canada, this involved the literal kidnap of Indigenous children from their homes and their forced education and special schools to assimilate them by making them white. This was in recent history, ending in the 1970s. It's also shocking that also very recently, in 1967, a decision was made through a referendum to change the classification of indigenous people from previously, quotes, flora and fauna, literally to recognise the humanity of the people who had been dispossessed and excluded by British settlement and the creation of Australia. There's a lot of history there to deal with, and there can be no denying that contemporary Australia is still trying to, or is in need of, addressing that recent past. It may be too optimistic to think that a single TV drama can make a difference. The obvious example is Alex Haley's Roots, though even in that case, 40 years on from the dramatisation of the US's shameful history of slavery, it is still controversial to remind white Americans that black lives do actually matter. On a lesser scale, perhaps, the BBC drama Downton Abbey was part of the process of nostalgic reimagination of English history that has led to the horrors of Brexit, the rise of xenophobia and the idea of Empire 2.0. By placing Clever Man in the superhero genre, the stakes are perhaps a little less high. Within the genre, the success or otherwise of the superhero rest on their portrayal, backstory and powers, not on the politics of their context. The creation of an indigenous superhero in Clever Man is a very powerful thing. As the series creator Ryan Griffin has said, I realised I wanted to create an indigenous superhero that my son could connect to like he does any other superhero. But, as with Jessica Jones, the superhero-ness of the story is only part of a much larger picture. In the case of Jessica Jones, this was white male violence, control and rape. In Clever Man, it is white Australia's ongoing legacy with the indigenous peoples, which does also include male violence, control and rape. Clever Man's story is about the emergence of another, quite different indigenous population into the light of Australian society. These people are not the known indigenous people. They are what are called the hairy people. They have been known to indigenous people for millennia, but are unknown by Europeans. Six months after these hairies emerged, a near state of war develops between them and Australians, or more particularly, against the hairies. In the past, in actual Australian history, difference from Indigenous people was marked racially by colour of skin, as referenced by the fleeting use of the term by one Indigenous character, I'm a black fella, remember? In the 19th century, 
Such difference was studied and described in highly scientific terms, such as measurement of skull sizes and shapes. Largely, though, the prevailing view was that Europeans and indigenous were of the same species as humans, although the latter were classified as a so-called lower variation than the former, using terms such as primitive, less intelligent, less advanced. In the fictional world of Clever Man, the Harrys have again been categorised as different, this time by DNA structure, which has in fact classified them as non-human, and thus they are termed subhumans, or subbies. Most of the arc of the story of Clever Man is about what a society can do, and in particular the violence it can get away with once a group of people are categorised as subhuman. At this point, we can insert here any other non-European group that has been put into the crosshairs of white European civilization, that is, settler colonialism. Most poignantly, in the story, the actual, real-life indigenous people are ironically seen as human vis-à-vis this new group, the Harries, the Subbies. But of course, the centuries of suppression and racialization, together with the indigenous respect both for the culture and humanity of the hairy people, puts most of the indigenous protagonists as well at risk as hairy sympathizers. But the narrative is also about European attitudes to others, outside and also within the context of Australia. The assumed subhumanity of Africans, indigenous groups in America, various Asian contexts, and of course the ongoing stigmatization, securitization, and racialization of Muslims. Clever Man coincides with the detainment of migrants by Australia on Manus Island, which overlaps with the dramatization of the urban zone for the confinement of the Harries and their sympathizers. After two series, the show has explored with brutal honesty what such denial of humanity can lead to. This can include both enlightened and violent genocide, the former through a positive program of assimilation called inclusion, the latter through a sickeningly simple portrayal of a massacre of Harry's, made most harrowing by its relation to actual massacres in white Australian history. Alongside this, the show has also been about humanising the people it portrays. The Harrys are so named because they look different. That is, they are racialised, not only as black, but also as hairy. Apart from their DNA, they also differ from humans because of their far greater strength and physical ability, and because they live much longer, three times more than humans. The drama humanises these subhumans. These include the teenager, Latani, forced to cope on her own after the death of her younger sister and the detainments of her parents. There's also Lantani's mother, Araluen, played by Tasma Walton, who after capture is forced into prostitution for the service of white male humans. In the second season, the storyline also narrativizes the difficult choices of assimilation, taking the Kool-Aid that removes hairiness, which supposedly allows them to live safely among humans, albeit segregated and clearly identifiable as former Harrys. The intersectional nuances of race and gender play out in the characters. In the racial triangulation of Clever Man, the humanisation of the indigenous characters is extremely well done, particularly with respect to the difficulties and impossibilities of living across the colour line between whiteness and indigeneity. As Noah Balatsky commented in The Verge, In Clever Man, the only moral place to be is standing with the hairy people. The difficulties and ambiguities of contemporary life and racism are explored. This includes the protagonist, Cohen West, the son of an indigenous father and white mother, whose uncle Jimmy passes on to him the status and power of the Clever Man. Cohen's auntie Linda, his father's first wife, represents some of the old-school elements of contemporary indigenous life whilst her actual son, Wairu West, complements and mirrors the challenges of living across the two different tribes, indigenous and white, embodied in his half-brother Cohen. Alongside these, Wairu's wife, Nerida, and her daughter, Alinta, are the strongest representations of contemporary indigenous identity. Nerida is caught within 
but constantly fighting against the tripled forces of discrimination against her as an indigenous woman with sympathies for the Harrys. In many ways, Nerida is the centre of this story. However, I do have two concerns about Cleverman, based on what I've seen so far in the first two seasons. On one level, these are relatively minor issues, but they're also significant, particularly because they most likely arise from necessary production compromises. As the producers and writers are well aware, indigeneity in Australia is very diverse. For the narrative and the dialogue, certain decisions have had to be made. The story focuses in particular on Gumbainga people of northern New South Wales, to the extent that their language Gumbainga is used as the language of the Harrys, even though the cast are from many other groups speaking quite different languages. If a white Australian or international TV audience had been presented with the rich diversity of indigenous traditions, languages and cultures, then this would probably have been too much. Ryan Griffin has said that in his research he has drawn on, with permission, traditions from a number of different indigenous cultures. Unfortunately, to enable a smooth narrative, I think the majority of white viewers will conceptualise from Clever Man a sense of homogeneity and unity of indigenous cultures and traditions. This is largely due to the serious lack of other portrayals of indigenous cultures on television. It would be too much to squeeze the rich and deep diversity into this one drama. Both seasons of the drama are brutal in their portrayal of institutional and systemic white racism against the Harrys in particular, and also against indigenous people. It is a direct dramatic critique of what has been, and largely still is, fundamental to Australia. Government, media, the police and science are all shown to be serving the interests of white supremacism. This is shown to be endemic, particularly through the popular support for the anti-hairy actions of the so-called Department for Human Safety. But it isn't total. What is not shown so much, however, is how such white supremacy can often be done with the best of intentions. Not all those who benefit from and seek to maintain the relations of power do so out of their own self-interest. Some of the best of allies can be the most complicit in the systems of oppression. After all, white Australia, and much of the British Empire, was built by those who thought they were doing a good thing. Some of these ambiguities are hinted at with the character Charlotte Slade, the doctor in the zone, and perhaps by the containment authority police officer Tim Dolan. But so far the subtlety of Waru's conflict doing the wrong thing for what he feels are the right reasons, have not yet been played out in full. Perhaps the strongest dramatisation of this conflict is in Jared Slade himself, the most sinister of characters, and yet with his own form of sympathy to Harry's and sense of self-goodness. He is a Dr Mengele who thinks he is actually going to help perhaps some of the people he is harming. In conclusion... Clever Man is a very unusual and challenging piece of television, whilst drawing on what is usually a very conservative form of action drama. It packs a hefty punch in the gut of the white audience, its main target. Few will likely expect its fierce dramatisation of racism and genocide. It is also an ambitious attempt to represent one of the most misunderstood of indigenous realities, that is, the dreaming. White missionaries, anthropologists, writers and policy makers have all struggled to work out exactly what this reference is and how it is so central to the diverse indigenous societies. The classic accounts of the central Arenta people's concepts of Algeria were folded into the heart of classic sociology through the French writer Émile Durkheim. In his classic theory or explanation of religion, he assumed that the rituals and beliefs of the Arenta dreaming were the basic elements of all forms of religion. The dreaming is often referred to as the heart of indigenous religion in Australia. Such an assumption does, however, simplify the diversity of understandings of the dreaming among indigenous people. It also categorises the significance of the concept in very particular terms that is, as somehow akin to forms of Christianity. Suffice to say, this isn't a good starting point. What is called the dreaming is a series of tales and narratives, 
It is a way of understanding and being in the land and environment. It is a way of understanding humans and their differences. It is about things, human, creators, artwork, creations, and special objects. It's quite simply, in many different ways, central to the many different indigenous cultures. As Waro states in an early episode, it's not the dream time, which implies a specific static time. The dreaming is something that perpetually exists and is just there. And so, it is both a help and a hindrance to focus on this element of indigenous culture and society in an English-language drama created for a mainstream white Australian and international audience. Needless to say, the structures of such an action drama cannot do much to explain or even explore this powerful and diverse set of ideas and practices. However, Clever Man is about the dreaming, and it has to be, since it is about indigeneity in modern Australia. And so the challenges of trying to understand the dreaming in a contemporary context are not ignored and play out well in various ways, not least through the central character of Cohen as he becomes the clever man. Indeed, as Jacob Nash, a production designer for the show, has suggested on a publicity video, Clever Man, the TV show that is, is a contemporary dreaming story for 2017. The tension between temporality and the beyond-within-time element of the dreaming is referenced by the title of the final sixth episode of the second season, which is called Living on Borrowed Time. On one level, this could simply refer to various characters, as the season reaches its climatic conclusion. It could also, of course, reference the predicament of the hairy people, in the face of the overwhelming power of security and science that is deployed against them but it is also the spoken words of a hairy as he decries the presence of white Australia in Sydney on traditional Bindawu, indigenous hairy land. This echoes the phrase that is commonly used about indigenous land rights. Always was, always will be, indigenous land. This is not a threat and is certainly not presented as such in Clever Man. Instead, it is rather a statement of indigenous reality that is woven into the Harry's fight for survival. And like the Clever Man storyline itself, who knows how that narrative arc will turn out in real life. So that's it for today, and thanks, of course, for listening. As usual, if you want to find out more about this topic and the podcast series as a whole, then you'll find more details on the podcast website, which is at histories-inc.com. That's histories ending Y-S inkcom In particular, you'll find there a link to a written blogged version of this episode. You may also be interested to know about the other podcast I do, which is called Religion Bites, about the contemporary study of religion and culture. That can be found on another website, Religion Bites, that's all one word, religionbites.xyz. There's a link on the Histories Inc. website to that Religion Bites website too. The podcast, the Religion Bites podcast, is rather different from this one, and I hope you'll give it a try. And of course, if you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher, don't forget to subscribe for free to the podcast to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. And if you like the podcast, then do please leave a review. It helps other people to find this. And one last thing before I go. Thanks again to the University of Glasgow School of Critical Studies for the access they've given me to the recording studio where today's episode was recorded. That's all for today. I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.